one of the things that I've noticed uh, about American literature is that when some of my favorite writers who are writers of place from the American South, Flannery O'Connor, Eudora Welty, uh, are asked about what, what about growing up in the South had anything to do with your writing? Uh, one of the things they, they all said was back in the South where we grew up, people told stories. And if you got in a car today and drove, well, not today, not, not in March. <laughs> if you wait about three months and drive through Pilsen, down 18th Street, down those side streets, still, uh, even today, you'll see uh, people sitting out on the, on the uh, front steps of those apartment houses. Some of them still don't have air conditioning, which is one reason they're sitting out there. And uh, they're, they're drinking a bottle of beer uh, and they're telling stories. They're, and and I, I'm not sure the same thing, I'm pretty sure the same thing does not happen in the suburbs. So I, I kind of just grew up uh, realizing that that was entertainment. That was the way you made each other laugh. That was the way people got the news in the hood. And uh, it became a real resource for writing. I want to learn a little bit from you about what you see as the true power of, of story, storytelling or telling stories. Yeah. You could get really philosophical about it, and I'll try to prevent myself from going by an Israeli uh, historian called Sapiens. And he starts the book out more persuasively. Uh, it's, it's not his fresh idea, but he, he gives a more persuasive version of it than I've ever encountered, which is that one of the things that separates homo sapiens, human beings, from all other animals is that we're storytelling animals. And one of the reasons we're storytelling animals is that we have something else that most animals don't have. It's not that animals like crows and corvids in general and uh, maybe apes and so on and so forth don't have language. They have, they have a limited language. Ours is not limited. Not only that, they don't abstract their language into writing. And that's the main thing that human beings do. So his point is that we're, we're wired to tell stories. You can be somebody who doesn't want to go to movies, who couldn't care less about reading a book. In some way or another, they're, they're going to be narrative speakers. One of the reasons that we rely on narrative is we can't remember without it. By casting what happens in our lives, in the lives of our families, in the lives of tribes, in the lives of nations, into stories that sometimes we call history, that's how we remember. So um, one of the things a writer does is a writer takes what everybody does, absolutely every human being does, which is to tell a story and the writer turns it into an art. Just the way a writer takes what every human being does, which is to cook and some writers and some cooks call themselves chef and open up restaurants and turn cooking into an art. That's amazing. And I, I, I'm going to open it up for um, other students. If you want to uh, ask a question, please type it in the chat and I'll, I'll bring you on. I have a, a ton more questions, but I would love to, to spin it to you students. Uh, if you have, want to take an opportunity, type it in your chat. Um, ben, do you want to ask your question? Do you have a favorite book or if not, what's your favorite genre? You know, I don't think I really have a favorite. Um, I have favorite books in all those, in all the different genres. Uh, in, in including playwriting, and um, I don't exactly. I, I mean, I know that it's easy to study genre. It, it have dividing things into genres makes them easy to study. It's it's what it's also sometimes called Aristotelian Aristotelian thinking, and universities are based on it. You want to study ducks or 
birds or you want to study animals, you divide them into um, different groups, i.e. genres. But um, with writing, I, I'm kind of more, in some ways, more interested in how the genres overlap, how, how they operate uh, in coordination, how a short story genre can be full of very poetic prose, things like that. Awesome. I know, uh, Sky, I believe you have a question. Do you want to come on to the mic and ask a question? Right. Um, so do you have any recommendations for like poetry writing? Poetry writing? Um, well, I mean, the, the last question kind of implied one is that writers learn through reading. Writing and reading are not the same thing, but they're joined at the hip. So the one of the first things to do is to try to, uh, you, you know, uh, so every so often I, uh, I'll encounter somebody in a poetry class who really hasn't read, I'll, I'll ask the class at the start, who's your favorite poet? It's not a test. I'm not judging anybody on that question. I'm just trying to get a sense of, of, of who's read what. And there'll be people in there who haven't read poetry in it. You know, going back to my earlier statement, if I, it was a music class, let's say a class on rock music or hip hop, and I asked that question, what's your favorite hip hop artist? Well, I don't really listen to hip hop. What are you doing in this class? I just, so that, that notion of, um, kind of reading uh, and, and hopefully reading um, carnivorously. That is a writer reads differently than a general reader reads. A, a writer reads for what they can beg, borrow or steal. And uh, when, when you're reading a favorite writer, one of the things that you're doing there is you're, you're trying to figure out why you like that person's work so much and what you can learn that, that you can apply to your own. So that's one thing. Um, I, I think, I, I, I won't go on and on and on, but I'll name one more. One of the most basic things um, that I found helpful for myself and that uh, when I teach my classes, I always try to make sure students see it, is that um, just because we use language for everything else, as we do, doesn't mean that we come into a class about poetry or, or the desire to write stories um, knowing what that art form is about. There isn't any reason that um, you've ever written dialogue. You know, you might have, have written all kinds of stuff for your classes, and essays, and laundry lists, and every other kind of a thing. There's no reason that a uh, a non-writer would have ever really written dialogue, which is one of the absolute primary um, things that a, uh, a writer needs to know how to do. So uh, just the idea of realizing that you're gonna have to learn the, the craft and then figuring out how, how to go about doing that. Amazing, uh, Giselle, did you wanna ask your question? Um, how did where you grew up like affect your writing style? Um, well, one thing, you know, I'm, I grew up in a heavily urban neighborhood. So I think your, your question is about style now. Style kind of depends on subject matter a little bit. They're not the same thing. But just the fact that I grew up in this neighborhood um, with a lot of diversity, and that was highly urban. Um, it created subject matter for me that I then needed to, to find a style for. So I just got done talking, for instance, about dialogue. And one of the things about the neighborhood is that everybody wanted to be a comedian. And um, when you told stories, if you could make them funny stories, all the, all the better. So um, that kind of, gives you a focus on how people talk. And um, it, it's not just in, in writing rough draft, but in rewriting a dialogue, you're always trying each time you, you go over it. If it's meant to be funny 
or meant to be kind of wisecracking or um, you, the, the very first time you, you've written it, uh, maybe you don't get it, get that kind of life into it, but you keep rewriting it to um, emulate uh, the life uh, that pe the, the way people talk on the street. Yes, thank you so much. Um, what advice do you have to give to someone who wants to be like a poet or a writer or wants to go into that and needs inspiration, I guess? <laughs> ah, <laughs> well, that's a really good question and it's a difficult question to answer. Um, I'm not sure that there's any one particular thing that, that, is, that is kind of serves as general advice. Different people are inspired by different things. So, I mean, I'll give you a personal example. I started off by saying, um, I played saxophone for, in several different groups. I love jazz. Um, I worked in record stores. I worked in a jazz record store when I was in, in my teens, uh, so on and so forth. The, uh, one of the writers that some of you may have uh, read who had a very similar past, although I don't think he took the kind of music lessons I did, but he worked in record stores is Murakami, the, uh, the famous uh, Japanese uh, writer who when I was in Japan, I met him and we just had this great conversation about music. And one of the things that we had in common was um, both of us somehow wanted to figure out ways that we could be inspired by music. He does not write to music. I do write to music. So I've got, uh, let's say I was going to throw a party. Um, I'd sort out certain kinds of music for the party. If I thought we were going to maybe do a little drinking and maybe uh, around 11 o'clock at night, people might feel like dancing, I'd kind of sort out dancing music, or if it was a dinner party, I'd sort out a different kind of music, something to kind of play along as you eat. But I, I've got this whole stash of, of, of albums called writing music. And that would be the last kind of music I would play at a party. It's somber, it's sober, it's repetitive, it's kind of melancholy. It's kind of Philip Glassish. It's kind of Miles Davis. You know, it's it's low key. It would clean it would clean out a party immediately. But when I put that music on, it's like putting on a soundtrack for a film that hasn't been made. And I put it on, and it helps me open the sensors of my mind and get into my imagination. Now, I want to rush to add when I said not everybody is inspired by the same thing, that um, Joyce Carol Oates, who's a good friend of mine, uh, and we taught together at Princeton, when it was her birthday, I gave her, she plays piano. When it was her birthday, I gave her some Chopin piano music. And I said, um, these nocturnes, I, I write to nocturnes sometimes. And she looked at me like I was nuts. She said, what, you write to music? I said, yeah, all the time. And she said, God, once I put music on, I would never write. All I want to do is sit and listen to it. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if that, th there's so many other ways to answer your question. That's, that's kind of one of them. Um, the, what you could take from that is that the other, the other arts, paintings, sculptures, uh, movies are, are great ways to inspire writing because you can take ideas from them in a way that doesn't exactly feel like you're copying when you get them from books. But books are also great ways to get inspired. Uh, then uh, the last thing I'll add to that list is if you keep a journal, I don't mean a diary, although a diary is fine, but a kind of a what I call tongue in cheek, a great thoughts journal. You just kind of try to write in it every day. You recall memories. If you heard somebody say something clever or whatever, you write it down. That can end up being a, a, a real resource for you so far as finding inspiration for something to write from your own life. I wanted to just follow up on that because I, that's something that we, um, so we have this, um, 
this thing that helps students kind of continue to push forward on their pathway, which we have like digital badges where kids can explore different activities that they may be interested in. And one of them we're, we're developing is a creative writing badge. Um, and I actually did want to kind of follow up on, on if you had, you, you obviously have collections of short stories and was wondering, is there a, a particular way that you find inspiration or like a process that you have for inspiration? It seems like the, the, the journal is, is one of your bigger approaches. Um, but wanted to see if you had any other advice for a young writer or somebody that's exploring writing short stories for the first time. Uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm back to, uh, I, I know I'm kind of sounding like a broken record, but um, it, your, your, re your reading life is so tied up with your writing life. Yeah. That, um, and, and you want to keep reading because the more and wider range of writers that you read, the more ideas you'll have that you can apply to your own work. Totally. And every and so often, your music, um, your music one reminds me just like how uh, how similar that is. Like uh, you know, when when you think about modern music, um, mm -hmm. and you you try and say like, well, who are they? And they they talk about their inspirations, and you can hear that in parts of their music. You can hear you know uh, generations of musicians before them that they've listened to it, that they've kind of molded themselves from and, and drawn inspiration from. And, and what I'm hearing you say is like find out what you like to hear or what you like to read or things that bring you joy in that and, and try and understand why that brings you joy uh, in, in writing and try and maybe, you know, use that as, as some aspect of inspiration. Is that, is that correct? I, I couldn't agree with that more. Um, I, but I'll, I'll also point out that um, you can re kind of reverse the telescope on that one and, and you can see, um, that a lot of writers that you might like have done the exact same thing. That is, you can also find stuff that you don't like and figure out a way to define yourself against it. You know, you, one of the things that happens, for instance, is somebody reads a, a book and they just feel that, God, this is so sentimental. I, I'm just not gonna write this way. Or this is too flowery for me. Or conversely, this is too plain for me. And so you, 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 you kind of um, have these touchstones, both, both positive, mostly positive, in fact, I'd say, but also occasionally negative. Um, and and that, that combination then kind of fo uh, starts to form your inner aesthetic. I, I, what, what, what is it that makes you find beauty in language? And, and then you, you start working at trying to be able to realize it on the page. That's great. I, we have time for two more student questions and then I'm gonna ask my final one. So Tara, do you wanna come in? Yes, um, I'm nine years old and just getting started. Do you, have, do you think I should start with any poems or stories? Any books you should suggest? For nine years old. I, I don't know, this is one of, this is a goal. I, I haven't kept up with the exact books that are going, are, that are being written. But I do know that it's a kind of a golden age for, for children's books. And nine years old, you're still in that category. The next step up, um, young adult is absolutely exploding. So if you're at all precocious, which you might be given that you're, on this, on this link, uh, you, you might even take a look at um, some young adult books. One of the things that's happened in the young adult field is that they, the, a lot of the writers still are in awe and really honor uh, tale-telling writers. So there's great imaginative works out there, you know, um, works where, a, let's say a cat might be your familiar, by a familiar is, some magical creature that helps you through life. Uh, on, on the other hand, um, children's literature and especially young adult literature has become way more realistic. Um, but specific writers, I wish I had one right, right at my fingertips to recommend, but I don't. 
Avni, do you want to come on and, uh, and, and ask your question? Yes, thank you. When did you start loving writing? I have an essay on the subject. How much time do I have here, Andrew? Do I have two minutes? You have as much time as you need, but uh, we want to be respectful of your time. Okay. So here's, here's, here's what the essay was based on, a real story, autobiographical. Um, the uh, subject of the essay that made me write it was, how did you get, when, what was the first thing you ever wrote where you thought you might be interested in writing? So I uh, grew up in Pilsen, a real city neighborhood. I was in a Catholic school. A lot of the kids uh, from Hispanic families and Polish immigrant families who lived there, um, that was a part of their culture. And um, somehow in fourth grade, I became a bad boy. I, I don't even know how I managed to do that. But um, I, I was like the ideal kid up through third grade, a great believer in all kinds of, I you know, went to church every day and so But by fourth grade, I don't know what's just whatever it was, but I stopped doing my homework and so on and so forth. And I'd get in trouble all the time. And one day, um, my mother um, got, I, I, one day I woke her for school in winter. And I had woke, awakened during the night because my mother had the flu and she was up sick and I could hear her sick in the bathroom. And that meant my father had to make breakfast for us. My mother generally made us breakfast every day. He had rushed off. He worked in a foundry. He rushed off to work. And there on the breakfast table was a breakfast cereal I had ordered because if you ordered it, you got a code ring. It was called Ralston. And it was made by a company that made dog food. And it tasted like dog food. And my family never let us throw food away. So now that I had ordered Ralston to get my code ring, um, I had to eat it. And there was a bowl of Ralston on the table, which I promptly took to the bathroom and flushed down the toilet. And now I had an empty table and I had a whole morning and I had a, a, a um, single loose leaf sheet of paper that I was supposed to fill out. I hadn't done my homework again. I was supposed to write, we were studying Africa and geography, and I was supposed to write a story. I was supposed to write an essay about Africa on a single three-hole sheet of loose leaf paper. And I began trying to write about, not like I knew a darn thing about Africa. I was in fourth grade for God's sakes. Never been outside of Chicago. So I started writing and I got to a place where I wanted to describe how tall the trees were in Africa, because my idea, all of Africa, unlike Andrew's informed idea, was that it was just all one huge jungle. And the tallest things I had ever seen in my life were skyscrapers downtown in the loop. And so I described the trees as the tree scraped skies. And had and I, at that moment, I had at, how old are you when you're in fourth grade? Eight, right, or nine? I had invented metaphor. It didn't matter that it had been invented before. I had invented it at that moment. A thrill went through my body, <laughs> a feeling I had never felt before. I, I read that sentence over and over to myself and I rushed into my mother's bedroom where she was still sick and had this pail by the bed so she didn't have to run to the bathroom it should the heaves attack her. And I began saying, listen to this. And I began reading her. And unfortunately, she began throwing up right in the middle of my reading. But the thing that made all the difference was that the next day in class, the nun who was teaching fourth grade read my um, loose leaf paper to the class. And I didn't know it at the time, but at, from that point on, spelling was a school subject. Punctuation was a school subject. Writing was not a school subject. 
Writing was something special. Writing could give you a thrill. Writing could make you feel that something magical just happened on a piece of paper. And I, I carry that around with me uh, without even knowing that I was until I was older and it resurfaced. That's such an amazing story. And I think it's so important for them to hear because I, I know um, you have a lot of people, kids in this chat that you know writing is a passion for them. And I know Sagna, you're about to come on and ask your question, but Sagna is one of the leaders of our writers group, which is a student-led young writers group that they want to lead on their own and explore writing um, just in their own free time. Um, do you want to come on and ask your question? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so you've talked about how your child has uh, your childhood has affected um, your writing, um, but how do you know when to add um, like the perfect mix of real life experiences and fiction into your stories or your writing or your poems? Um, I don't know that I ever find the perfect mix, but it's it's and um, sometimes what you learn to do is make informed compromises. But I, 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 what I love about your question is the whole notion that you've, you have in mind already that there's a mix that you can, if, if you start off telling a story that may, maybe uh, is autobiographical, let's say, something that actually happened to you, something that happened, let's say, with a friend um, one day when you were playing ping pong. And you know you're writing fiction, so you're under no obligation to, to tell the truth about that story. That story is just serving as getting you started. Your allegiance when you're writing fiction is not to autobiography. Your allegiance is to the imagination. So in the middle of trying to tell something about that ping pong game that's stuck in your mind, if some imaginative idea that never happened enters your mind at that time that makes the story better, your obligation there is to make the story better. If you're a newspaper reporter, you can't do that. Your obligation as a reporter is to the facts, is to the truth. The, um, but fiction is sometimes described as the lie that tells a greater truth. That is that, um, that is that sometimes you imagine something that makes the story better, will engage the reader more strongly. And that tells, uh, it, you know, they're kidding when they say the lie that tells the greater truth. But what it really means by that is that fiction tells a different kind of truth. And that sometimes um, it's a deeper truth. So I, I don't think I quite answered your question, was, which was more of a how-to question. But um, I, I did focus on that kind of a idea of mixing fact and fiction that I thought was uh, in your question. Wonderful. And, uh, and I know I, I have a ton of students that are asking so many more questions to me in the chat and, and have really loved this experience. I just have one last question that we ask all of our guests, which is, the role of failure. Um, you are such a distinguished author uh, over such an amazing career. Um, and students might see that and think again, like, you know, not, not see the moments that you are, you feel conflicted or that you're experiencing failure in that way. Um, and just want to have an honest dialogue about it. has there been a time that you can remember um, reaching failure and what you learned from that failure that helped push you forward? Um, there's so many failures. The, one of the things that happens as you, as you write is um, you learn stuff about yourself that you wouldn't have uh, known if you didn't try to do, uh, I mean, I'm, writing's hardly the only profession where that does happen, but uh, again, something that applies to one person doesn't necessarily apply to another person. Growing up where I did, I developed a kind of a thick skin. And it's really, uh, I have a lot of friends who don't, don't have it. 
And so um, if, if you do, you're lucky. If you don't, you're gonna have to find a way to understand that um, failure is part of uh, trying to do something. And that because you might fail at a particular story or a poem or have work rejected, it's, uh, there are all kinds of ways that you can turn that into a positive. Number one is there's an old um, cliche about writing that like a lot of cliches is absolutely true. Writing is rewriting. That means that very few people ever write anything first draft that gets published. And so um, turning your quote failures into a um, critical response, that is rather than just flailing yourself or not having um, managed to write a story as good as you wanted to or a poem as good as you wanted to, but saying, okay, well, look, what, what is good about what I wrote? Is there something here that can be salvaged? Can I put it away for a while and come back and look at it maybe in a week, maybe in a couple of weeks? And um, rather than, than decide to go out in the yard and have a bonfire, um, uh, when I get a little bit more perspective on it, because um, one of the things about feeling that you failed is you're not always right. Failure, failure is a, it, it, it comes from a, a, a kind of a perspective. Um, so there, so um, given that failure is part of the game, part of, part of the learning experience, part of the growing experience, uh, one of the things that is very helpful is to kind of uh, develop a um, something in yourself that gives you enough distance from it so that it doesn't incapacitate you. And the reason I picked out that word perfect was that one of the things that can uh, figure in that kind of incapacitation is, is striving for perfection. Sometimes you, 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 really, you really just uh, end up trying to write the best story you can, not a perfect story. And, and there's a difference between those two things. That's so great. Because I think one of the things that uh, we always want to communicate with students is that um, in order to have growth and to push yourself to the edge of your competency, you are at higher risk of just having moments of failure, that's inherent in the process and that's good, that's growth, that's learning. Um, and it's so great hearing it from you that, you know, um, if you're really trying to do something and, and work hard at it and grow, you're going to experience these, these, these moments. And I just think it's always important to know because I know um, at the, in those moments, it doesn't always feel that way, right? You know, you, you, sometimes the, the pain is there and, and you need to kind of distance yourself from the emotions of it to realize um, the growth that, that that's potential. Um, I, I cannot I, make you know, Andrew, I, I, I could give you a couple. <laughs> let me give you one real quick story. Wonderful. When I was at the University of Iowa, my office mate was a guy named Tracy Kidder. Um, and uh, Tracy had come to Iowa, like everybody else there. It's got, it has the most famous writing program in the United States and maybe the world. So there's a lot of kind of people who um, didn't know whether they were gonna get in there or not. And once they were in there, they thought, well, this is kind of proving to me that I'm gonna be able to succeed as a writer. And then they get there and, and it's not working out for them. And one of the things that happened with Trace was he, he wanted to be Jen Steinbeck. He was looking to write the truly the great American novel where you go out there. Uh, he came from a background of Harvard and growing up on Long Island sailing and so on and so forth. So uh, when he was in Harvard, he used to take breaks and ride the rails and interview all the railroad bums as they were called at the time and try to get this sense of the United States. As he began, as we began critiquing each other's work in the workshop, he suddenly had this realization he was not as good a fiction writer as he wasn't the fiction writer he wanted to be. He was reading stories by young writers his age 
that he liked better than his own work. And the reason I'm telling a story about him is that I have so, ad so much admiration for this guy <laughs> because rather than giving up, he had a passion for writing, he loved writing. Rather than giving up and saying, look, these people are better than me, stuff I'm writing here, it's okay, but nobody really likes it that much. Is he, it happened to be a time in the United States that nonfiction was just changing. Instead of just journalism, it was becoming this great art form. And in fact, what was going to happen right early at that time, it hadn't happened yet, is that nonfiction was on its way to become the dominant art form in the United States. But back in those days, it was just starting out. And Tracy, rather than give up, said, hey, wait, what if I take the talents that I do have, creating a scene, doing character? I'm really good at research. I'm not good at writing about stuff I do, but maybe I'm good at writing other people's stories, interviewing them, and then trying to write their stories. What if I try nonfiction? So he went and got on the road, found some nonfiction stories, began trying to write them, taught himself to write nonfiction by, by failing at that over and over, and um, kept trying to write these stories about uh, working class people and stuff. And one day, uh, an editor who had taken a real like to his work said, Tracy, you know what? You're from a family that went to Harvard. You're from a family that grew up sailing on Long Island. Why don't you try writing nonfiction about somebody from your background? And Tracy said, well, like who? And the guy he was talking to him was a managing editor of the Atlantic Monthly. And he said, look, my roommate in college is now working for a computer firm. Computers had just started getting big at this time. So you realize how far in the past this is. Why don't you... And he loves to sail. Why don't you guys go sailing together? And then maybe he'll take you to work and you'll learn all about this new computer industry and you can write a book. So he did that. It took him a year and a half to write that book. And he wrote a book called The Soul of the New Machine. And when it came out, it won a Pulitzer Prize. So he's had like maybe six, eight, um, uh, bestsellers. He's considered today one of the great nonfiction writers. You want to learn to write nonfiction, you read, you read Tracy Kidder. And back at Northwestern about five or six years ago, just when Morty came, first time Morty was present, came as president, uh, he brought it, he made the, the one book at Northwestern for that year, the, the book called Mountains Beyond Mountains that Tracy wrote. So, you know, you don't give up. That's part of Part of writing is skill, talent, and uh, learning the craft. Another part of the writing is care. Amazing. How stubborn are you? How disciplined are you willing to be? I mean, that, that's such a um, powerful story. And I think it's, it's you know, I, I appreciate you taking the time today. I could not be more appreciative of, of the lessons that these students have learned. And they've all sent me private messages already saying just uh, what a great, uh, conversation this has been and so enlightening for them. So thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing your experiences with us. Um, we are forever grateful for this. Thank you. I love young writers. Maybe some of you guys will take a class from me someday. <laughs>